My name's Jeremy Chapman. I was recruited uh, here to Westmead from Oxford in 1987 and I've been here ever since and it's been a fantastic place to work. My role at Westmead has been as a kidney specialist, as head of department. Uh, I have had managerial roles with uh, various divisions that have uh, appeared and disappeared over the years and I've been on the board of uh, Western Sydney Local Health District. I was working as an intern at uh, a cardiothoracic unit and I got a phone call from the HR people in Guy's Hospital in London saying, are you coming for the interview this afternoon? Um, they sent the interview request to my uh, home address and because I was on such an onerous roster, I hadn't actually been home to pick it up. That interview was for the um, real unit uh, SHO, Senior House Officer position at Guy's and that was my first introduction to patients with kidney failure my first introduction to a highly performing academic unit and my first introduction to kidney transplantation. And I've never wanted to do anything else ever since. I trained in Guy's, then I went to Oxford. I did my thesis in Oxford. And then just as that was finishing, I was invited to come out to Westmead where we started up, Richard Allen and I started up the kidney and kidney pancreas and then islet transplant programs here at Westmead uh, and um, have been able to go from strength to strength in the field of transplantation. Uh, I've uh, chaired a number of organisations over time uh, and been president of the International Transplantation Society and the World Maradona Association in that uh, journey, always focused on the issue of taking people who are going to die without transplantation and providing them with a real alternative. You asked me about equitable access to kidney treatment services um, at a national level, at a local level, at a global level. There are huge issues. Um, the World Health Organization now publishes data um, which shows the very dramatic differences across the world of access to end-stage renal failure programs and to transplantation programs, both geographically and by gender. Uh, so in this country, access to transplantation is gated through access to the transplant waiting list. A shockingly small number of our dialysis patients get through the process of getting onto the transplant waiting list. You might want to guess in the second or two before I tell you. Less than 8% of dialysis patients are on our transplant waiting list. That's a surprise. Does it mean that less than 8% of patients are suitable for transplantation? No. It means that our mechanisms of putting people onto transplant waiting lists are highly deficient. The reasons for that are complex and multiple but sending a letter from a transplant unit having seen a transplant patient to a local GP to say the patient needs the following six things done doesn't even get close to putting those patients on the transplant waiting list especially if they come from a rural or remote environment so we have special problems in Australia globally there are also special problems with respect to donation versus transplantation. In some countries of the world, actually quite a lot of countries in the world, a lot of the living donors are female and the recipients are male. Not actually true in this country, the majority of our donors are male. Um, but why is this? Why? What impacts across the world are there? And sitting here in Australia, we sort of live in a, in a comfortable world where people are provided clinical therapy irrespective of their ability to pay for it, especially transplantation. It's all done in public hospitals. Across the world, that's not true. And so if you can't pay for your transplant, you're not going to get it done. And so in many countries of the world which don't have universal health care provision, it's all about money. And we know that money is not, is not equitably distributed. So a complex set of issues 
both with respect to geography, healthcare financing, and um, uh, gender all across the world. Australia has its own set of issues, and we need to deal with them here. So you've asked about ethical transplantation. And that is an overriding issue for people involved in transplantation, especially with respect to living donation, but also with respect to access to deceased donation. What is ethical? And like many debates there, it's easier to say, what is unethical? Well, let's start with the worst case scenario. It is unethical to execute people and then allow the prison staff to make profit by selling the organs to wealthy foreigners. That's unethical. We have no problem with that. It's stopped finally stopped in 2015. The coercion of a poor person to provide their kidney or part of their liver for a wealthy person. Oh, we're just paying him to help or her to help us and we want to reward them for doing it. Absolutely not. You're coercing the poor in a way that you couldn't or wouldn't put your own family at risk. Unethical. So we have many unethical um, practices around the world and they all revolve around commercialization of the human body. The World Health Organization has been very clear, first in 1991 and then reframed with the involvement of the Transplantation Society uh, in 2010, commercialising the human body is not permitted. And unfortunately, there's a great deal between a World Health Organization statement, agreement, and the implementation around the world of doing that. And so the Transplantation Society, which I uh, headed for a number of years, spend a great deal of time working on the professional response to this. It is, after all, someone with a knife who does an operation on two people, and that someone is usually, but not always, a trained surgeon. Some countries, it's been the theatre technician who decided he'd learned enough to actually set it up in a little village setting in a house. Um, none of <laughs> caring about the outcome of the patient because you get paid up front. Um, and so we have had to establish a set of professional standards that we as doctors can live by. And those standards are called the Declaration of Istanbul. So like the Declaration of Helsinki, you can't do transplantation without the Declaration of Istanbul, just as you can't do research without adhering to the Declaration of Helsinki with its modifications over the years. So we've worked very hard through the Transplantation Society to establish ethical standards, both at a global country level, working with the World Health Organization, and through professional standards for professional societies and doctors working in the field. Has that shown fruit? Has that bared fruit? Yes, in some instances, and no in others. And so anybody who thinks that you promulgate a set of standards and it's all over, it's fine, is naive. What we're dealing with here is fundamental human behaviours for survival. The rich will look to use the money for their survival. They will. And that, in doing so, is unethical. And that is the problem that we continue to live with and need to combat continuously by exposing it, by shining light on the practices, by providing clarity on what is and is not professional practice. 
and that has consumed probably 15 years of my life. Peter Medawa was tasked in World War II in England to try and solve the problems of airmen who were burnt badly in their aircraft in the Battle of Britain. Those young kids had multiple burns over huge areas of their body and it was unsurvivable. And so he was tasked as a scientist to look at how do we transplant skin to solve these patients' problems? Can we use animal skin? Answer, no. Can we use other people's skin? Answer, also no. Why? And that was the question that he set about answering. And in doing so, unraveled the complexities of what we have been dealing with ever since in transplantation. How to evade the body's systems to reject foreign cells, foreign tissue. He formed the Transplantation Society in uh, 1966 with colleagues interested in the field. And he was the first editor of the journal that I now edit, the Transplantation Journal. Um, he set the course of a scientific research for transplantation, which has borne fruit ever since. So in 1990, the Transplantation Society coined a medal for the recognition of lifetime achievements, essentially, in the field of transplantation. And to be given that is a sheer delight. To have work recognised is amazing. To understand that all that work comes from teams of people is important. And lots of people say that. But it's really important to understand the transformation that we've had in transplantation. We haven't got there yet, but let me give you an analogy. When we did our first successful kidney transplants in 1954, December the 23rd, 54, first successful identical twin transplant, that was analogous to the Wright brothers flying 100 meters a few feet above the ground. Highly dedicated, very specialized, focused individuals, very brave individuals, set off to achieve something, and they did. But what does it take to build a Dreamliner or an A380? And the answer is not the same approach. You cannot have an individual build an A380. It doesn't work that way. No matter how brave, intuitive, interested, engaged, and intelligent they are, you need a team of teams to build an A380. And we need teams of teams in healthcare to solve the big problems in healthcare. And mostly we've got little teams that are not connected. We're beginning to change that. But the most important thing about a recognition of an award is to understand the teams that connect and one's role in helping those teams connect. So at Westmead, we have multiple collaborations all over the world to build the teams of teams that can solve the big problems. Otherwise, you're just puddling around in a little muddy field trying to make something happen, trying to fly 100 feet above the ground because last year you could only fly 10 feet above the ground. That is not going to build the Dreamliner or the A380. So my purpose over the last 20 years has to build teams of teams to focus on the big problems. And if that's recognised, I'm very happy. In 1978, I met young men and women who were dying of kidney failure and dying despite dialysis, and we transplanted them. And they didn't die. And they were back to normal, back to normal health. That's a miracle. And when you see it and feel it in your training, you have to make sure that you can provide that same outcome for as many people as possible.